Paris, Texas was an organically grown movie, shot in just a few weeks from a sharp script, which was developing day by day as the storyboard leapt to the screen. It's Wim Wenders and Sam Shepard, so there's no surprise there. It would be futile to try and develop a unified theory of what this movie's about, although it's tempting and many critics have tried. It's a film about forgiveness in extreme circumstances, fatherhood, self-imposed isolation, and the forced camaraderie of road trips, paying the bills however you can, the dull safety of cities, and the punishing freedom of the wilderness. <laughs> One of my greatest regrets in life is that I never saw Harry Dean Stanton perform with his band in L.A. A passionate musician, Stanton was also one of the greatest actors we've ever been blessed with. I can't imagine him as a baby. Stanton looks like he came out of the womb with a cigarette in his mouth and fatigue in his eyes already. In addition to his gut-wrenching role as the father in Pretty in Pink, which I've talked about, Stanton has major parts in two other all-time classics, Alien and Repo Man. In Alien, he's one of the early victims, a guy who loves his cat enough to get offed right after John Hurt. And following John Hurt out the door and isn't a bad way to go. In Repo Man, he's Emilio Estevez's mentor in the car repossession business, a job you don't think about unless you get yourself into a bad spot, and a job that pays much less than risking your life is worth. But his best role ever is in Paris, Texas, as the drifter Travis, a role Stanton said was what he'd wanted to play for his entire career. He's mute for the first 25 minutes of the film, letting his face do all the work. In the opening shots, Travis inexplicably wanders the American Southwest in a suit. He finishes a large bottle of water, conscientiously caps it, and then litters. This guy has two alignments, simultaneously lawful good and chaotic neutral. Travis wanders in from the desert and gets drawn back into suburban life in Los Angeles by his caring but pragmatic younger brother, who's been raising Travis's son after four unexplained years of Travis and his wife having disappeared. The brother is played by Dean Stockwell, who is said to have been ready to quit acting at the time. His performance here led to what I hope was a very lucrative run as the holographic sidekick in Quantum Leap. This movie shifts tone dramatically as it progresses, but not jarringly. It begins almost wordlessly, showing how Travis elicits both kindness and cruelty from others, with sweeping southwestern vistas. The second section follows Travis's low-key comic adventures in suburbia, getting to know his son. Travis believes he can find the boy's mother, Jane, so the father and son launch off on a road trip with a limited timeline to locate her. The father and son in this final section have adventures together. Full of bonding and not devoid of frustration, they reach Houston and they have a tense stakeout where the walkie-talkies the son Hunter had insisted on buying become tools in locating his estranged mother. Travis manages to find his wife Jane, now employed in a peep show, and they have strained and harrowing discussions. Yet in these naked, painful talks, there is a sense of hope, which ends with Hunter in Jane's arms, reunited as mother and son. Hunter is a very lucky kid in his way. He now has two fathers and two mothers. But both whose father? My father. How, how, how can I have two fathers? Just lucky, I guess. Though his biological parents are unwilling to both be present in his life at the same time. <laughs> Ry Cooter's repetitive score, which riffs on Blind Willie Johnson's blues classic, Dark Was the Night and Cold Was the Ground, fills in the blanks on what's on Travis's mind. Sad, tender, repetitive, but hopeful. The peep show pushes the movie into David Lynch territory, with garish lighting and weird, unconvincing sets for the girls' sexy conversations. The climax taking place in Diner, complete with fake coffee. Both of the women that Travis speak with admit a little too readily that they hate this job. Yeah, but I'm over here, can't you see me? Sweetheart, if I could see you, I wouldn't be working here. Even for the day crew at a strip club, their behavior seems like it would get them fired quickly. Director Wim Winders is always whimsical in the bleakest of ways. He gave us City of Angels, where a depressed guardian angel falls for a circus performer in Berlin and befriends TV star Peter Falk. Hey, what, this is cool, no, he gave us Until the End of the World, a sci-fi road movie where William Hurt pursues a machine that records dreams across Japan and into the Australian outback, and he finds that his own dreams are a narcotic. Paris, Texas, which has none of the supernatural elements of those two films, is still in that ballpark. Winders avoids Hollywood tropes and potential romantic setups, or you're not my real dad cliches. What Travis did in Mexico for four years and why he came back is never really explained. He never goes to Paris, Texas to see the land where he'd hoped to build a home, but he carries a photo of that spot and a snapshot of himself and Jane like talismans. It's a slow film that submerges you in its scope, both that of the characters' feelings and their surroundings. I could 
see where it's very European style and it's very European disregard for Los Angeles geography might turn some viewers off. For me, the performances in the sweet, funny script, with Travis delighting in the small pleasures despite being at the end of his rope, make this a riveting 147 minutes. <laughs> The wonderful thing about this film is that it really has no villains. Okay, there's a crass German doctor who saves Travis's life at the beginning and reconnects him to his family, but then makes a nasty plea for compensation. But that's about as bad as it gets. The boy Hunter fairly quickly adjusts to having two father figures. Oh, Mom. Don't go, Clint. Hi, Dad. Hi, baby. And while his aunt's stepmother is clearly unhappy about, about Travis rocking their steady nuclear family, the most likely scenario moving forward is that Hunter and his birth mother Jane will move back to Los Angeles and get emotional support from his other mother and father, keeping at least two steady wage earners in Hunter's life. Where the movie leaves us floating is the ethical dilemmas. Travis and Jane clearly had a sick relationship, and they ended up both running away, leaving Hunter thankfully in the care of a loving family. And as the movie's plot progresses, what Hunter has moved out on by lacking his adventurous genetic parents is made more and more clear to the kid until he and his father drive across four states to do a stakeout that must take place on a specific morning in a specific place, bringing his parents' adventurousness directly into the kid's life. Sadly, Travis and Jane seem to agree that they are oil and water, and Hunter can only manage one of them. I don't think that's a fair decision to make on Hunter's behalf. Joint custody might have worked, but the movie leaves you with Jane whirling rapturously around with Hunter in her embrace, given a second chance to become his mother. Maybe not the mother he deserves, but she's going to try. Paris, Texas lulls you into rooting for these confused, broken people. I'm going to go cry now. Mm -hmm.